Welcome everybody as the American Space Museum presents Stay Curious. I'm Mark Marquette and so glad to have with me Steve Kane beside me. Hi Steve. Hello. Steve Kane is K-A-N-E and Steve was a space worker. He's got some great stories to tell you about the wonderful space shuttle program. Look at this behind us there Steve, one of the orbiters going out to the pad. Uh, 39A or B, probably A. And We've got some space history for you today, including Steve worked on the return to flight STS-26 33 years ago today. We're going to talk about that. And this oral history with Steve Kane is brought to you by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment that we're so grateful for to buy equipment to help us do things in a little fancier way than Marty Winkle and I did for a year. Marty's behind the camera and co-producing with Jessica Galloway, who has waved her magic wand and changed our whole look of Stay Curious. And Steve, you've been a fan of it since the beginning. It's changed a little bit, hasn't it? It has. I, it, I am a big fan. I think what you're doing is fantastic. Well, appreciate it. We've been, Steve is actually a friend of our museum, and, a, and uh, we share an office space where his company, Space Tech, is located. They certify space workers and aviation workers, and we're going to get into that. Uh, because uh, right now you're testing 60 aviation workers in Orlando, right? We are, yes. Uh, as part of the Aviation Electronics Association, they have four conferences each year. They spread them around the U.S. This one is the Southeast Conference. It's in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And my partner, Carolyn Paris, certification manager, is over there right now conducting those tests. So. And we share an office where we have our eBay presence. And uh, from time to time, we'll be posting things that we are selling on eBay, but we've got about... 90 items up there right now and uh, Steve loves it because he comes to work and he's in a space paradise everywhere you go we've got stuff it, it's pretty incredible what, what has walked through our door because every bit of that eBay stuff we have in our space tech uh, uh, shared uh, building has walked through the door Steve it's kind of incredible well, it has and, and I, I get a kick out of watching you you know with these artifacts because you know they're irreplaceable these, these things are, are pieces of history that are just you know, there's no value that can be assigned to them. And to just see how, how you care for that and your interest in that, to me, is pretty special. Well, thank you. It is, it is fun. We're caretakers here at the whole museum of the birth of the American Space Age, and Steve was part of it uh, in the shuttle era. Marty Winkle worked on the Grumman Lunar Module, and uh, Jessica has got ties to Vandenberg with, with uh, her and uh, uh, her husband. But we wanted to give a big birthday shout out while I'm thinking about it to Jesse, Jessica's mom, Sherry Graves. Happy birthday to you. Uh, she's in Wichita, Kansas. She works for Spirit Aero Systems that you're familiar with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, I, and, I actually worked through Wichita State University on a grant. So okay. I've done a lot of work with, with Spirit, and some of the production managers of Spirit, Boeing, yeah. Well, Sherry Graves, we hope you have a wonderful day. It's your day and your daughter loves you and wishes you to have a great My day and your little brother's birthday yeah. oh no oh, he's got to share a cake i don't know if i'd no. be good at that uh well we're got we got another birthday coming up but we're and we're gonna have a nice talk here with uh, uh steve kane uh who was a quality control inspector for nasa during the shuttle era and he's got something to show us here in a little bit that was a big quality control issue uh, about a third of the way in the program. But a couple of interesting things in history today, Steve. Sixty years ago, the dinosaur contracts were issued, and you have to be a dinosaur to know what that is, yeah, okay? I, that's because in 1961, on September 29th, uh, the United, uh, U.S. Air Force awarded contracts for the first concept of a space plane, and it was going to be launched mm -hmm. on like an Atlas rocket, uh, or a Titan rocket, one of them, and uh, but that never came to fruition. Ten, uh, that was in 1961, 60 years ago. Ten years ago, China launched its first space station, Tangong-1, and kept it up there for about five years and then deorbited after three crews went up there. And guess what, Steve? They've got their Tangong-2 Heavenly Palace yeah. is, is ready to uh, uh, accept the next crew out there. So... Uh, but also in space history, something that uh, we'll kick off today. Oh, don't want it that way, that way, that way, that way. Well, I don't, well, how we, there we go. We got out of sequence there. Is today in space history 
is the first Canadian satellite was launched at Vandenberg Air, Air Force Base, and Steve's got affiliations with Vandenberg he's going to tell us about. 59 years ago, a Thor Agena rocket launched Canada's first satellite. You're looking at it here. It's called Alouette. They became the fourth nation on Earth to orbit an artificial satellite. Uh, of course, behind Russia in October 57, their Sputnik, their Sputnik 1. We followed four months later with uh, uh, in January 58 with Explorer 1. And the British were the third with Ariel 1 in April 62, just beating Canada into space. Uh, and you know what? This satellite worked for 10 years. It is still orbiting Earth about 500 miles high, where it will stay for at least another 1,000 years in space. Canada's first satellite. All right, now that's getting some bang for your buck. Jessica, we've got a comment from... Ophelia's going to get mad at you. I want you to tell me the name of that satellite again. Alouette. Alouette. Alouette, yes. And Ophelia's in Paris. Thank, nice to see you. Au uh, Francais. And I'm uh, an embarrassment to Marquette name, <laughs> but that's 35 years in Appalachia, y'all. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's changed me a lot. I, I got the, the Buckeye in me where I say cricks and, and wash. You call them uh, pops? But I call them pops, yep. Okay. And listen, but now we're going to drink a soda. Yeah. All right, in there. So, uh, uh, Steve, where'd you grow up? Grew up in the uh, mountains of central Idaho. Did you? Yes. Okay. Small town, uh, pretty remote. So what kind of dreams did you have as a kid that brought you uh, to this fabulous career you've had uh, in aviation and space technology? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, it wasn't really a dream. It was actually more of an order. An order? Yeah, the magistrate judge uh -oh. in, in my local town gave me a choice. One of the choices was the military. The other choice was probably not anything I wanted to do, which was a boy's ranch. Uh huh. So I took the military option. So you were a little precocious as a young I, man, I was, you're saying, huh? Okay. <laughs> I was pretty hard to manage, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, they got Ritalin for stuff like that today. They do, but that yeah. back then, no, they didn't have anything. <laughs> All right, so. right. They just threw us in a cage and said, yeah. we hope you get red or yeah. better in but, there. Yeah, the, the Navy really saved my life. It taught me a career. Uh, it taught me a skill, which led to my career. You know, so I really, you know, have to thank that mm -hmm. judge. What rank did you end up with in the Navy? I, I was an E-5 when I separated after four years. Uh, aviation structural mechanic, uh, working on... Yeah, we got a picture here, Marty, of uh, the first, uh, these, how you got into the uh, EA6Bs. That's really what started my my career. Mm -hmm. Was There's the first airplane. That's a 1970s era plane. Yep, it was called a Prowler. It's uh -huh. a jammer aircraft built by Grumman, and was really what they Grumman, used all right. to uh, interrupt ground radar. You know, when whenever sorties were occurring, and so it was very electronics heavy aircraft, uh, pretty heavy aircraft, had four seats in it, had a pilot, and then it had the, uh, they call them ECMOs, electronic countermeasures officers, occupied the other seats. And my job was a structural mechanic, so I took care of all the structure on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So anything that needed to be fixed structures-wise, access panels, a lot of corrosion Seats, control. things like that, probably, in and uh, out? And, yeah, or... in and out, yeah. but then the the air crew folks took care of all the others equipment but mostly it was structures that i did so a lot of sanding and painting and cleaning and scotch bright right pallets and pallets of scotch bright really the corrosion and yeah yep. in there well uh so all that so that that's really how, how it all started for me well good and and uh then how did you jump into the uh aero the the space shuttle era then Where... well when i separated from the military you know that really generated a love for aviation. And part of the skill set that I obtained in the Navy allowed me to take the airframe and power plant exam to become a licensed aircraft mechanic. And when I did that, you know, actually as I was going through A&P school, because I had to do some of the power plant work before I could test for power plant, but the instructor in the course kind of pulled me aside one day and he said, yeah, I don't know what your plans are, but he said, if I was you, I would look at the airlines versus general aviation because you can make a lot more money in the airlines than you can in general aviation. So when I left school, you know, the first job I applied for was with a regional airline. That worked. Mm -hmm. I got the job. And I ended up through the course of the next eight or nine years 
working for four different airlines around the country. Hmm. And each step was a progression where I went from, you know, floor mechanic to uh, working different systems, a project lead, uh, doing upgrades on aircraft. I went into uh, sh- the quality assurance role there as a shift inspector, then became lead inspector. So, you know, aviation at the time was my, was my really my love, but that's what allowed me to then move into aerospace because I was working in Santa Maria, California for an airline, Wings West Airlines, and anybody that flew in and out of Vandenberg was familiar with Wings West Airlines. It was the regional airline that flew, or the only one, yeah. And so while I was working for them, one morning I picked up the, the newspaper and I was reading it, and this was before internet, so uh, ads in the newspaper were something that you went through pretty regularly, and I saw this ad from Lockheed Space Operations Company that said, we've bid on a contract at Vandenberg to produce a West Coast launch site for the space shuttle. Hmm. I thought, hmm, that's exactly what I thought. So I thought, well, there may be some opportunities there that I don't have in the airlines. So what they were looking for, A&P mechanics specifically. A&P so means? Airframe and power plant. Airframe and power plant, okay. Mechanics. So I put in an application. You know, I filled out the application that was in the paper. I sent it into their office and didn't hear anything back. A year and a half later, I was actually working out in Merced, California at a, a maintenance base that we had out there. And I got a letter from Lockheed saying, we have a position if you're interested and we'd like to interview. So I went back to Santa Maria from Merced and interviewed and was hired and then moved back to Santa Maria and began working on Slick 6 at Vandenberg as a quality inspector working the systems activation that we were doing at the time. And Lockheed won the contract from Martin Marietta Martin had done the initial work on the pad, but there was a lot of work that had to be done to get it activated. Mm-hmm. And we uncovered a lot of problems. Things had to be fixed. You know, the initial cold flows, you know, part of the propellant for the shuttle program is liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. And those are, are stored in storage areas with interconnecting piping, you know, to bring them to where they are used on the launch site. Mm-hmm. And all of these were built from specific materials, Invar specifically. And the first cold flow that we did in those facilities, they ran liquid nitrogen through the systems to cold shock everything and see how it worked. And they discovered that all the bellows, because those expand and contract, all the bellows were made out of the wrong material. Oh. And it ruined every one of them. Oh, every wow. bellows contorted out of shape. And so we had to go back in and rebuild the entire complex uh. and fix all those problems. So. There were a lot of problems. Uh, we did have the first flight set of boosters stacked on the launch site out there. It wasn't like here where you have a, a mobile launcher platform that's in the VAB. You put the shuttle on that. You roll it out to the pad. At Vandenberg, they had a launch mount. It was a fixed location. So everything was stacked on the launch mount, and the buildings actually moved to Away cover the it. launch mount. So, so they opened up. They closed up. They had a shuttle assembly building. They had a payload changeout room. And they had a mobile service tower that completed that enclosure. And then all of those, when it was time for launch, they moved away. And so. Sorry, I didn't bring a picture of, of Vandenberg. Uh, uh, got one in our, our, our office over there. Uh, Vandenberg, for those of you who don't know of the, shuttle year, the shuttle's 30-year history, uh, was going to be an alternate site. And Steve, tell us why. Well, where, where were they going to use uh, 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 the... Uh, well, see, space the, launch uh, pad number six, which they called Slick Six. Yeah, Space Launch Complex Six was the military's manned space program. And it actually, Slick Six was rebuilt after the manned orbiting laboratory, which the Air Force started. The mole, yes. The mole, the mole project. Uh, they moved away from that. They moved to shuttle. And everything was pretty, pretty well built and tested, uh, ready. We had the flight stacks there with the boosters and the tank. We're only waiting for Discovery. Discovery was the orbiter that was earmarked for the military. and The Air Force were essentially going to buy Discovery, but, but why, why Vandenberg? Well, Vandenberg allows a different orbit mm-hmm. to launch into a polar orbit, which is more difficult to attain here on the East Coast. On the West Coast, it just gave them additional strategic opportunities, I suppose, which was one of the reasons they, they wanted to launch from there. But also going north and south up the yeah. east coast was more dangerous than yeah. going up north uh, towards uh, Alaska. Where Vandenberg's located is the furthest west 
westernmost point on the continental U.S. Mm -hmm. So they were really, you know, it, it was a prime location for doing that kind of work. So it was a spy satellite launch pad, basically. And but, actually, yeah, what, but, what but are you talking about? But of course, they just launched the Landsat 9, which is agricultural and, and ecological and stuff. What was interesting about the arrangement for the orbiter, it was at, at a facility called V-19. V-19. Which was on the north base where the, the runways were. Uh -huh. And then Slick 6 was on the south base. And Vandenberg is split by a state highway. So to get to the south base, you have to leave the north base, go through a gate, go down the state highway to the coast and then take a left and go on out to, did they? They, they moved the gate. It's straight out. Oh, okay. It's straight out. Yeah, that, it was quite a uh, it's an manipulation. It was this is 1978, uh, 79, This 80, was actually 85. 80, oh, 85, 80, okay. 85, 86. Okay, the shuttle yeah. era had started. and this The other is, thing that was really cool was the, the road that went out to Slick 6, the hills on each side of the road were too tall. For the orbit, so they had to come in and lop the tops of those hills off so the wings would clear as they went out. I've seen and pictures of that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the, the, the orbiter transporter vehicle that they used here actually came from Vandenberg. And all of the equipment that went into what was then the OMRF, which is Orbiter Maintenance and Refurbishment Facility, and be, became OPF 3, came from V 19 at Vandenberg. Hmm. It was all loaded on a barge. They went around through the Panama Canal brought it up here and then all that equipment was moved in. That actually, when I came back to the space program after Challenger, I was laid off from Vandenberg. Everybody was let go out there. So I went back to the airlines for a couple of years. And while I was working in Illinois for an airline you know, up there, uh, I got a, a call from my mother actually. And my mother said, I had an interesting call from Lockheed today and they have a position for you if you want to call them back and here's your number. Cause that was my permanent number that I gave them when I was laid off. And so they offered me the position here in Florida and I took it. So you came here and we're gonna get into that in a minute. You you were actually got drawn back in from the private, from the uh, commercial aviation yeah. uh, for the return to flight of STS-26 that happened 33 years ago today. We're gonna talk a minute about that. Uh, but Steve, you're a fan of our, our show here. Can you believe we heard for yesterday from a person in India, uh, Gerda Spur, India, Longjia Sani. Hi, Longjia Sani uh, from India. Uh, we've got a f good friend of mine, Cliff Watson, watches from Sonoma, Queensland, Australia. Maddie Haven, hello to you in the UK. Dean Babcock was watching the other day. And um, Graham Shaw is another uh, name that's popped up there on our Stay Curious comments. Uh, along with uh, dozens of others that watch it every day. And, and we're so grateful for that because, as Steve knows, our proud nonprofit for 20 years has been preserving the birth of the space age that, that he was involved in and now inspiring this next generation that you're working with. And we're going to talk about that next generation uh, in detail. Uh, it, it's so interesting that you had a, you're testing people now for the careers that you once had. Correct. And... and uh, uh, has it cha has it changed a lot the landscape in this 30 years of technology? Well, it has. Uh, shuttle was old technology. You know, when you think about the orbiter and, and the solid rocket boosters and the external tank, uh, conceived in the 60s, designed in the 70s, and built in the 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, late 70s, early 80s. So, you know, by the time it was actually produced and in place and operational, it was already old technology. When you think about technology changing every four or five years, uh, we actually did several modifications through the life of the program to bring the orbiters up to you know current technology, such as the glass cockpit, mm -hmm. you know, and, and other things that were done. You know, that was kind of a continuous process. But as as we certify the next generation of space tech or spacecraft workers, it's important that we stay in touch with technology and and a lot of the, the new space companies have done things a little bit different than the traditional NASA way of doing business. And, and so the paradigm has changed. You know, we, we've seen the cost to space get reduced dramatically mm -hmm. as a result of that paradigm shift. Landing boosters, that was something that NASA dreamed about, but uh, was never through the course of this, the shuttle program able to uh, accomplish. You know, we see that as a pretty regular feat now with SpaceX. Yeah, we're pressing, so, right, pressing their 100th yeah. one there. In fact, Steve, to your left there, 
uh, and that, Marty might zoom in over there in our little corner over there, are two 5,000 pound thrust uh, fuel yep. cells for the Via yep. Space Brevard County's hometown rocket company, Fiber wound, led, yep. led by astronaut Sid Gutierrez. Uh, plastic fuel in those babies, and mm -hmm. there's no no sign warning. Uh, you know, we didn't have a convoy bring it in here. Uh, it's just laying there because we're going to have a via space room. They're going to be partners here, uh, all built with 3D printers. Yes. By the way, and it's actually the only engine, the only rocket engine produced that uses 3D printed fuel. Yeah, via space, and they're they're going to launch rockets with plastic and and uh, uh, laughing gas uh, basically. Yeah. Uh, but and well, we, we want to uh, segue just for a minute here uh, before we start talking about the historic flight 33 years ago uh, of uh, uh, got a, another birthday today. Not just Jessica's mom, uh, Sherry Graves, but we've got another birthday today. And as I hit this and go there, today is the 79th birthday of this gentleman. Uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. His birthday today. Happy birthday, Bill. Uh, there's a, his NASA administrator picture there. There's his handprints, okay? All right. Yep. That looks good, okay? Yeah, there you go. You can see the imprint on. This is what our museum's all about, is these bronze handprints were uh, harvested by our, our board of directors, uh, Chairman uh, Charlie Mars, and um, uh, there's a little shine on it there to see him there. Uh, to commemorate our Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts at Space View Park. And uh, Bill Nelson was at one of the events that Charlie harvested a couple Apollo guys. So we got his on there. And it's really cool. These are very heavy. And we've got Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. We got Sally Ride in the museum. Eileen Collins, whose new book uh, uh, helped written by our friend Jonathan Ward's out today. And uh, Kathy Sullivan's in the building too. America's first woman to do a spacewalk. Uh, Bill Nelson uh, uh, went to space uh, the uh, three weeks before the Challenger accident. Um, if I got another picture, there's Bill's handprints there with my hands on them. And uh, he considers himself a, a, uh, a uh, passenger, uh, not a, he doesn't brag about being a full-flung astronaut or anything, he just considers himself a passenger. Of course, Jake Garn was the first non-citizen to go up, and he was a senator from Utah. And then uh, Nelson went up, uh, uh, and he wrote a book, uh, Mission, an American Congressman's Voyage to Space. And uh, so uh, NASA's 14th administrator, he's a Democrat senator from Florida and was in the House of Representatives for about 20 years. And you, of course, know this gentleman living here in, in Florida. And uh, we've got him as the administrator, Pam Melroy as the assistant deputy administrator, and Bob Cabana is third in charge. Yeah. Seems like our space program is in pretty good hands. What do you think? I think so, yeah. I think, you know, the leadership is there. You know, those, those folks have all had a deep history, you know, with, with all the work that's been done, especially here at the Kennedy Space Center. So, yeah, I, I think it's in good hands. I mean, you're no stranger to the politics of, of space, I'm sure. When it comes to budgets and spending money, and yeah, I've I've done a fair amount of work with budgets here in the last few years, especially after moving to Space Tech. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about Space Tech, and or no, let's talk about this crew. Space Tech's uh, and, and uh, 33 years ago, this is what our heroes looked like. Yeah. These were the men that were taking us back to space after 20 months in the anguish of the Challenger accident. Uh, and they saw seven of their friends lose their lives, uh, and they flew in these uh, blue suits, basically, and this was the first all-veteran crew since Apollo 11 in 1969, and, and this is 1988, okay, uh, and it was led by uh, uh, Fred Hauk, who's 80 years old. Hope he's enjoying the day. These photographs are by uh, Mark or Tom Usiak has have sent us this picture, or these photographs, friends of our museum. You've heard us talk about them. Yes. Uh, there, that looks better. <laughs> Me, I like that, Jessica. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, also Dick Covey is 75. Dick Covey is the second man there on the left in the orange suit. It's the first time they wore space suits. 
since STS-4, all right? They just flew in like oak coveralls, thinking it was safe as could be, and the, the orange pumpkin suits uh, become in vogue. Dick Covey, who's 75, was actually on Capcom and said the words, go at throttle up 70 seconds after launch, and then shuttle blew up. Uh, very famous uh, shocked look on his face and all the, the, the footage you see of that. John Lounge has deceased. He was uh, a member of this crew. Pinky Nelson is 71, and David Hillmars is also 71. And no doubt they're reliving this moment in history when everybody's hearts were pounding because you were one of the space workers of thousands, and these five men had the entire American space program on their shoulder. Absolutely. And I don't think that's any sort of exaggeration. You lived it. What do you think? Oh, I agree. You know, that, that was paramount in getting the U.S. back into space, you know, and, and that was the reason I, I moved to Florida was to, to be involved in that. You know, the, the two years I was at Vandenberg gave me a real taste of the space industry. Going back to the airlines, I missed that. So the opportunity to come back here to Florida and join in this effort. I was actually working in the firing room when this launch occurred mm. because of the, I worked firing room at Vandenberg as well, mm -hmm. one, of, one of the jobs that I did. No, Marty was in the room too yep. at LC12 for the yep. launch process services there. So you guys were in the same yep. firing room and uh, didn't know each other probably, no, did you? we didn't. Uh, and and here, here's that beautiful launch. Uh, thank you, Tom Uziak or his brother Mark. They'll hand wrestle to figure out who took it there. Uh, nice and uh, this would have been film photography back then, folks, uh, not digital. So uh, uh, even more challenging, gorgeous, gorgeous launch there. Yep, those are uh, the loud and proud days. Those are the loud and proud days. What did you miss that, that you wanted to come back when Lockheed called you to come back for this important mission? What, well, what were you missing? You know, me being an aircraft mechanic, you know, I worked on a lot of different aircraft, you know, in my time there. But the space shuttle program, the orbiter, to me, was the ultimate airplane. More of, of a cross between a pressurized aircraft and a submarine than anything. And it was just really a, a, mm. an opportunity to get back involved in that. Just the fact of watching those vehicles go into space is something that, that you just you never really get over. Mm -hmm. yeah. And being and part so of it, like, and, you, and like, you, of it, like yeah. you and Marty were there. And there's another gorgeous shot. I'm going to blow that up there to so, just uh, another, wow, that's a, a unique angle there. Yeah. That's got to be 39A because I recognize the row uh, on the left there, a yeah. fence from the uh, SpaceX launches, I think, uh, there. And uh, rolls over, uh, has to do this maneuver to get its heading up there. I always thought that was weird that it, was, it wasn't flying on the top. It flew on the underneath. Uh, and then uh, so... Uh, and there's another, there's that back launch there. And the gorgeous launch there, and take us out. The, um, what were the, the challenges of that day 33 years ago? All right, with everybody's hearts in their throat. Uh, what, 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 I mean, what was that like? Well, working in the fire room, you know, there was a lot of excitement. You know, we were, we were console monitor quality control was what our title was. And so we were actually in a room kind of off of the main firing room. And our role was to follow along in the procedures, make sure that everything was accomplished as it was called out. And if there were any deviations or anything that was different, you know, to let the launch team know that. Uh, so we were, you know, involved right up until, you know, the point of launch and after when they achieved orbit. And so we celebrated right along with everybody else, you know, when that occurred. It was Pretty neat moment. Nine minutes to orbit, and uh, uh, it certainly was, and got us back on track. Um, and we're going to talk more about this with Triple T on on Friday when uh, yes, Travis Thompson will be back to do tales from the, the White Room on Friday. Talk Travis. to him today. He's a good man. Uh, he's a good man. You knew Triple T. Everybody, I when I said something about Travis Thompson to him, he goes, "Oh, Triple T," and because it's Travis Todd Thompson, and he's had a bout of illness and. Feeling a lot better, and, and he'll be back in the saddle here on Stay Curious uh, to give you some wonderful tales from the White Room. And there's a couple anomalies in the night White Room about this mission that you want to stick uh, around and see. Uh, but I love teasing t uh, 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 Steve here that 
he's the only man I know that has a building named after him, okay? This is the Kane Technology Wing in Nunez Community College in Char Charlemet. Charlemet, yeah. It's, Charmette, it's actually almost uh, a suburb of New Orleans. Suburb of New Orleans. So uh, I think that's so cool. Uh, they sent the, the janitor out there cause, uh, to take this picture because there's the hose in the yard he's yeah. dragging out there. Power wash. <laughs> Power wash. Uh, Steve, how cool, and, and how did this happen? Well, it's an interesting story about Nunez. Yeah, it actually happened because we have, at Space Tech, we've had a partnership with Boeing for, for many years. And the manager of training at Mashoud, NASA Mashoud Assembly Facility, the, is a, a, a friend of ours. Uh, and he reached out to us and said, Boeing is interested in ensuring that we have a continuous pipeline of skilled labor here at Mashoud. And there is no entity, no educational entity that can do that. And we were wondering if you could help us with that. And so we, we gathered up a team. Uh, we brought in a facilitator. We went down to Nunez. We uh, brought in the Boeing folks, you know, the production managers and the training managers to find out exactly what they were interested in this training to be accomplishing. We built that set of competencies for them. And in the Space Tech archives, one of the things that we've done at, at Space Tech is we captured the entire shuttle certification and training database from the shuttle era, everything that it took to train mm. and certify everybody that worked, you know, touch labor on those vehicles. And we have that now in, in a searchable database, and it allows us to customize programs as the needs arise. And the need was there at Mashoud. They wanted to ensure that they had a continuous supply of, of technicians. So they worked with us to build that capability at Nunez. But one of the things that happened at Nunez, you know, it's kind of a, a hurricane alley in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And Katrina came through. I did a lot of damage, but it was Hurricane Isaac, actually, that came through and did most of the damage there at Nunez. And it, it really wiped out their facilities, and they had to rebuild. And at the same time, Boeing was interested in putting some advanced training in because NUNED traditionally served the marine industry and the uh, petroleum industries, petroleum storage, uh, those type of operations, and they didn't have much to do with space. Mm -hmm. And at Mashoud, they're building the center section for SLS. Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's their, their primary role. And so they wanted these students to be trained in those competencies, those skill sets that they needed. And we had a lot of surplus equipment Space Tech in 2007 transitioned away from what was then Brevard Community College, and we moved into our own entity as a credentialing agency. So we no longer did training. So we had a lot of excess equipment, surplus equipment. And so I was able to palletize this equipment and send it out to Nunez to replace a lot of the stuff they had that was damaged, but also to give them a head start on putting all this together. Wow. And they honored you with that building. And so there. I was surprised. I saw the, the news release on that building, and so I sent a message to the program manager out there and said, yeah, that's a pretty interesting name. What a coincidence. And he said, well, no coincidence, named after you. <laughs> oh, who, who knew? Yeah. All right. That was pretty cool. And, and, and it, they, they're doing really good now. They, most of their uh, students go to work at Mashoud. Uh, they, at last count, they had 120 students in the pipeline. Uh, they have several that are working there at Mashoud for Boeing and for other contractors. So it's a pretty successful program. It's doing really well. Hmm. We're going to talk a little more about Space Tech here with Steve Kane, who's the executive director of uh, this company that certifies aerospace and aviation uh, uh, people and, and the, the technical things. I've got his the, the booklet here that they do kinds of all kinds of uh, certification. They've been credited for over t uh, 10 years to uh, supply this uh, service. The FAA Office of, Com of Commercial Space. Uh, says that uh, you can develop curriculums and performance-based certificate certifications for yep. technicians engaged in space vehicle manufacturing operations, and these are the good jobs that are out there right now. We're gonna, uh, exactly. uh, and, but these oral histories made possible by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment that we're grateful for, and we'll be bringing you more people. Uh, and what Steve's at the at the very focus of right now is what we showed in the headlines yesterday, Steve. Yep. 2,000 jobs coming to Brevard County for 
a company uh, called Terrain Orbital that's going to build a thousand satellites a year. Yes. And uh, uh, what do you know about the backstory on this? Well, thing? we work pretty closely with Space Florida. Space Florida. And we Space talked Florida. about yesterday's the government uh, agency in our yeah. our, our state yeah. that is uh, tasked to bring in space business. Uh, Dale Ketchum's been on our yeah. show, and and uh, yeah, D Dale's a, a a huge proponent. Dale's done a lot of work uh, behind the scenes to help bring these in. Linda Weatherman of the Economic Development Commission of the Space Coast mm -hmm. has also done a tremendous amount of work attracting these companies in. When you think about what's occurred here, you know, since shuttle retired, you know, we went through a, a fairly lengthy drought where we lost a tremendous chunk of our tax base. Uh, a lot of people moved away. And part of the, the reason for the companies coming here was that supply of skilled labor. But one of the issues was most of the supply didn't exist. Hmm. The schools in the area don't have large enough facilities and they can't produce enough students to meet demand. And so companies now have to resort to pretty expensive hiring practices where they offer incentives for people to move here. Uh, they provide them moving bonuses, relocation bonuses, and different things to bring them here. Uh, it was projected that the need between uh, 2020 and 2030 uh, was going to be over 10,000 technicians here. And that's pretty significant, but you in, need in the a ability to produce period. them. Wow. You need the ability to produce them, and it just wasn't here. So one of the things we've done is we partnered with uh, an individual out of the Tampa Bay area, a gentleman by the name of Brian Cam, who's the founder of the Space Coast Consortium Apprenticeship Program. And Brian actually came into our orbit when he was brought over by RUAG Space, which RUAG Space builds the uh, skeleton, the structure for Airbus OneWeb satellites. satellites. RUAG, huge produce. in Europe. They built yeah, most of the yeah, buses, they're, they're which is the foundation they call the satellite is the bus. Ruag's been involved in that as well as the dispensing uh, compartments yeah. to set to for multiple. Yeah, they, they do a lot of composite structure manufacturing, and the, and the facility is actually in the Titusville Logistics Facility, yeah, which is, it is just south of the city of Titusville, and they do a lot of good work. and And they brought Brian over because it was really site selection what they was what they were contracting with him to do, and so as part of that, you know, Brian conducted several town hall meetings. He stopped in at Space Tech and met us when we were in Cape Canaveral and had this idea that there needs to be an entity to oversee the development of this apprenticeship program. So Space Tech, you know, through our board of directors, we discussed it. We took on that role, and we've now produced frameworks that are approved through the state of Florida for three different occupations. So we have apprenticeships for mechatronics technician, for advanced machining, and also for fiber composite technician. You know, when you showed via space as containers, mm -hmm. those are filament wound. Those are built by composite technicians. And so via RUAG, Airbus OneWeb satellites, and Blue Origin now all have an interest in producing this skill set that they need. But not only them, we have other companies like uh, Knight's Armament Company, which produces firearms, right. a lot of different armament systems for the military. We have Diamondback, which not only does firearms, but they do a lot of other manufacturing as well company called Roswell Global that a lot of people probably don't aren't aware of that produces a lot of equipment for the marine industry. So these are the companies that we're supporting because they're all competing for the same pool of skilled labor. And so we have to produce more technicians to allow that competition to ease so that they're not all attracting from each other. You know, and that, that's really what's going on. And, and, and so that's, that's a lot of the emphasis that we have on our apprenticeship program is to build capacity, build capability, and, and ensure that we can do that. So you've got uh, one of our Stay Curious listeners out there has got uh, some high school kids or junior high kids that are science-minded or, in, you know, they're, they just don't always want to play football and video games, okay? I want you to speak to those parents out there or young people about what the future holds for these careers that you are certifying people to be in. Well, it's interesting when you talk to kids and you say, would you like to work in space? Yeah, the, the answer that you get usually is, well, I, I can't be an astronaut or I, I don't know enough to be an astronaut. I don't know math well enough. But what they don't realize is that for every astronaut that goes into space, 
there's thousands of other people that work different jobs to get them there. And those are all high paying, high skill, good jobs with, with really good careers. And that's what we're producing. You know, those, those are the, the, the jobs, the occupations that we promote. You know, the it, average entry level is, is over $60,000 at most of these yeah, mo most companies, of these right? So very, 60 very well to 80. paid, yeah. Yeah, entry yeah. level folks. Yeah. Uh, for a 25-year-old, we've had a couple. Marty and I've talked to a couple 23-year-olds in here that, uh, you know, working yeah. for one of the so companies. I, what here. I tell these kids when I talk to them, you know, when you think about my start, you know, it was essentially an apprenticeship in aviation. Mm -hmm. I spent four years in the military learning the skill. I left the military. I spent 10 years in the airline industry, you know, working on aircraft. But it was really the first couple of years. You're you're training. You're not really skilled at that point. And that's what apprenticeships do. You come into an apprenticeship, and ours are modeled after the German apprenticeship system in that mm -hmm. they're called a dual apprenticeship. The German <laughs> apprenticeship system. Yep. Dual. Now, that, that sounds very German. They do they, they multiple everything on uh, fail-safe uh, things. Um, well, what we try to do is partner with the local educational entity, and our partner institution is Eastern Florida State College. They have the facilities. We have the companies. And the dual education occurs when an apprentice is hired by an employer and simultaneously sent to the college for the occupational skill training. So they're working at the company, learning the company's process, but they're also getting the academics and the skills training at the college. This, these are two and a half year programs. So when you think about it, two and a half years, it's not a lot of time investment mm -mm. to develop a skill that will earn you a significant income once you complete that program. So that's and, uh, so that, and that's what I tell not only the, the students, but also the parents. And we work closely with Brevard Public Schools. Mm -hmm. They have two pre-apprenticeship programs. One is the Brevard Public Schools Adult Ed pre-apprenticeship. And the other is the Brevard Public Schools Career and Technical Education apprenticeships. And pre-apprenticeships have to be tied to an apprenticeship program. The Space Coast Consortium apprenticeship program is the only aerospace-focused apprenticeship program that exists that I'm aware of. Well, there's a big need, demand for the uh, space workers here on our space coast, and we don't want them to go anywhere else. We want them to. But well, we do, to, and, to, and that's what we saw. You know, after shuttle retired, most of the people left. You know, actually the touch labor. When you think about, you know, the shuttle technicians, there were there of the 18,000 people that worked at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, which is now Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, and the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, less than a thousand of those were the actual technicians that did. You know the technical work on the vehicles. Hmm. Uh, when the shuttle retired, probably 70, 75% of those folks left. And they went to places like Boeing and Charleston. Uh, they went to Lockheed Martin in Colorado. Some of them went overseas. Some of them were working for Lockheed Martin on the uh, uh, blimp programs mm -hmm. with Afghanistan and, and Iraq, uh, in Kuwait. So they were really spread around the world. And, and we have a, a cadre of about 450 aerospace technicians that we've certified. And what we do is we have a cradle to grave approach with our certifications in that every three years, they have to recertify. They have to provide evidence to us that they're still working in the field. Hmm. So we reach out and touch these folks and we find out where they're at, what they're doing, so that we can either continue their certifications or provide them alternatives of continuing education or, or retesting to, to maintain their certs. Well, Space Tech and its certification programs are, are what's helping these rockets go up off our coast and, for that matter, Vandenberg uh, the other day. Uh, and we wanted to tie up the Space Tech talk here because Steve's got some great shuttle stories I want to get to. But how about that plaque there of our wonderful board of directors member and big supporter of this museum, Al Kohler. Hi, Dr. Al. Uh, well, that, that's, I think he's probably watching there, and, and tell us about Al Kohler's involvement with Space Tech. Well, Al Kohler, Dr. Al Kohler was president of the Tiesville campus when it was Brevard Community College. And after a 30-year career at NASA, working in a lot of different systems, environmental, uh, he's, he's a, a mathematician as well. Uh, he moved to education, went to work for Brevard Community College, was running the Tiesville campus, and Dr. Maxwell King at the time, I believe, recruited him to come into this grant that they had just applied for through the National Science Foundation. It was a center grant. It was a significant grant. It ended up being about $10 million over 
the course of about 15 years that went through the uh, the national economy building aerospace capabilities. And so Dr. Kohler built Space Tech, essentially, and with the help of a lot of other people that, that he brought in. And as a result, you know, when I came into the program, I'm really a caretaker of what was produced. Mm-hmm. You know, my skill set is a little bit different and allowed me to diversify beyond, you know, just the space program, which allows us, you know, some sustainability. But really, the process, the programs, everything is what Dr. Kohler built. And what we did, you know, when Dr. Kohler retired in, at the end of 2013, we thought, well, what better way to honor what he's actually accomplished than to make him an honorary technician. So we built this plaque and presented it to him when he retired. <laughs> and, and we keep it on the wall there at Space Tech, and it's just a reminder, you know, really where we got our start, mm-hmm. you know. So, well, I just so. saw Dr. Kohler uh, uh, last week, and uh, he's he's a great man. He's mentored me at the museum. He's he loves mentoring people. I know that, but he's, oh, he's a good friend. Yeah, and, and I'd, he's. Uh, I'd just, like to uh, share my first encounter with Dr. Yes. Kohler. Yes, I actually, when I was working at United Space Alliance, one of the things I did was built a training and certification program. And as a manager, I was a quality manager. But as a manager, you're a presenter. You're not really an educator. You're not a teacher. And so I thought, well, what better way to learn how to teach, since I'm going to be teaching this program, than to go to work at the college teaching aerospace? And so I applied. I was hired. And a gentleman by the name of George Strom is the person that hired me. He was the program manager at Space Tech then. And so I started teaching classes at the Space Tech facility, which was actually at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So I'm in this class one day, and I've got 15 students that are all doing sheet metal work. And the class is designed for eight, so it's really overpopulated. Uh, it's impossible to watch everybody do everything. And all of a sudden, I hear this loud bang. And it was so loud that it startled everybody. and Everything stopped. And I looked up, and here's Dr. Kohler looking at me. And he said, if I ever walk in here again, and I see people not following safety rules, he said, you're fired. Whoa. So I said, well. Your introduction to Dr. Yeah, Kohler. That was my introduction huh? to Dr. Kohler. Yeah. yeah. So it, it got my attention. Got your attention. And from, from there on, you know, I did a lot of work after that. You know, Al brought me in to help build a composite program because I had some background in composite materials and inspection and different things. And so we were able to build the composite endorsement on the Certified Aerospace Technician credential mm-hmm. through Space Tech. But we also built the composite credential, you know, for Cert Tech. We built a curriculum. We test drove the curriculum all around the country uh, just to get it validated and ensure that Doug did what it was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of that work, I think, culminated in, you know, Al kind of recruiting me to step into space tech when Shuttle retired. So, And uh, Dr. Kohler and his father 50 years mm-hmm. ago built this diorama panorama of, of, Ca- of Cape Canaveral with uh, yep. working – uh, where the pads were and the rockets were buried underneath and then Radio Shack gears and washing wipers on cars and stuff they used to mechanically do this. And it was a big feature at the uh, American Space Museum when it was at the Miracle City Mall and, and uh, some other sites there. We've got remnants of it on the wall here in our Apollo gallery that we proudly show off. And Dr. Kohler uh, is working on that with the, Ken- the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex to have that uh, hologrammed or something for posterity. So yeah, it, it's so, really cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really really cool deal. We had to get Dr. Kohler in there, and we're going to get him on Stay Curious uh, right. as as soon as he uh, says that that he wants to be on the show. Uh, we can't wait for that because he he uh, went right out of high school to help him launch rockets as a as an intern, and then got his education and. And uh, great guy. And you, not we not know a lot of people know this, but he was actually on Dr. Werner von Braun's Army Ballistic Missile Team. Oh, really? That's how he got his start. And he worked in Huntsville okay. for a period of time with, with Dr. von Braun. Oh, he knew, yeah. uh, he knew uh, Operation Paperclip. He knew and, General and so, Medeiros then, I'm yeah. sure. And, and then and, he came uh, back here you know, when things were picking up here to actually build the, the, the launch site here at the Kennedy hmm. Space Center. Well, we're here with Steve Kane, who uh, has spent the last how many years with Space Tech certifying people? Uh, I've been with Space Tech now going on 11 years. 11 years, yeah. okay. After your shuttle career, uh, he, he got into aviation uh, uh, with uh, building airplanes, basically. 
But there's some interesting things that uh, you and I've talked about just to shoot in the breeze. And, and uh, he, let's talk about a couple of those stories that you've shared with me. Uh, what, what, first, we got to look at you in with a beard in a uh, uh, scape this was, suit. This was the early days, yes. You and Marty are both uh, uh, have been certified to be in a, in a uh, scape suit. We have one in our shuttle gallery. Okay. Marty's going to move that in on there. Yeah, go ahead and zoom in there, Marty. There, there, that, that. Yeah, and this was actually taken at Vandenberg. You know, I, I was. Escaped, zoom in there a little more, Marty. Show. I escaped at Vandenberg, and then I also escaped Thank here you. at the Space Center. Launch pads, the OPFs, just wherever it was needed. It was, this is really what brought me out of the firing room. You know, when I worked in the firing room as a CMQC, that was good, but I was an operational guy. I wanted to hands on hardware. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty difficult to find a transfer especially from the firing room because it was a skill set that was really needed up there. But the scape cert and the ability to obtain that skirt, that cert is what allowed me to then move into the OPFs. And scape suit means? Self-contained atmospheric pressure ensemble. And you wore these to do what? Well, mostly working with the, the toxic propellants. Mm -hmm. you know, the, Dangerous. The, the monmethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. That you put together create yeah. an explosion well, or a, a... There was always... You know, those commodities always existed in the orbiters, no matter where they were, mm -hmm. whether they Thank were in the Marty. OPFs, whether they were in the VAB, or whether they were at the launch pads. And so work had to be done, you know, to prepare them for flight. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, thrusters had to be changed out. Sometimes valves and different equipment had to be changed out. Sometimes it was just the ground support equipment that had to be changed out. But all of those had the toxic propellants in them. And so that work had to be done in SCAPE because mm -hmm. even small, small uh Parts of those commodities are pretty harmful. One of the things Steve's told me about working on the space shuttle that I find fascinating, and, and uh, of course Atlantis, I've been around it, and, and we got to see Discovery at the Smithsonian, uh, Marty, me, and Triple T in July. It was just huge. And when you're working in it, physically people are inside this thing, and when it's in the orbital processing facility, which was the three garages around the vehicle assembly building uh, uh, there were there was the the forward section the mid section and the aft yes and uh, as you guys have explained it to me and at one point in time how many people could be swarming around that 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 orbiter oh there were dozens yeah it depended on where it was on the flow exactly Mm -hmm. you know, and the flow being the processing, the processing from launch period, to, right. uh, from the last landing to the launch when, next the, launch. when the orbiters landed at the shuttle landing facility, there was an initial a ground assessment that was done. It was put on a, uh, it was actually towed from the, the uh, landing facility into the OPFs. And from that point on, most of the work was on the outside, mm -hmm. you know, as, you know, the, the, especially the thermal protection inspectors did their work, try to assess, you know, what damage was done during flight, what needed to be corrected and fixed and repaired. But then the work moved to the inside, you know, the payload had to come out, you know, that had been flown. And then the payload bay had to be reconfigured for the new mission. The forward section had to be reconfigured for the new mission. The engines had to come out, you know, all the work that had to be done in the aft section, you know, to, to prepare for the new engines. You know, all that work had to be done. So there was a lot of people involved in, in doing that effort. And what you don't think about, though, safety conscious as NASA people are, and I know they're some of the most safety conscious people in any business, uh, these workers in the, the orbiter create damage by stepping on things at the wrong place and time, though, though, though there's a whole infrastructure inside for you guys not to do that. But I'm getting to what you know about the wire story. Yeah. Uh, the wire stories on there. And uh, uh, Steve Kane was very involved with uh, uh, the wiring of the, the orbiters. And so just tell us that story that you've told me. Well, basically, when, when the orbiters flew, you know, from the time they were first operational, there were all kinds of things that occurred on orbit, all kinds of curious little uh, events that occurred. You know, they were some of them were random. They were fleeting events. They, they came and went. Uh, and we troubleshot those when the orbiters came back, and we fixed what we could. But it really came to a head, and this was Eileen Collins' first flight as commander, actually. And on ascent, the main engine controllers... Uh, one primary and one redundant were kicked offline. And when the orbiter came back, we brought it into the bay and immediately went to the uh, what were called the wire trays in the payload 
bay mm -hmm. area of the orbiter and started in the back and the first panel that we pulled off we found that while the orbiter was in its orbiter maintenance and modification period somebody had run a long screw down into a wire bundle mm. and as you take an orbiter and you lift it vertical the the wire cabling within the vehicle gravity pulls it down and there's a tremendous amount of weight there but it's hanging essentially when it's vertical and when it starts its its ascent all of that starts to move. It starts to shift and shake. And and what happened is it started to shake against that long screw that was protruding into the wire bundle. It just happened to short and cause that to kick off. They barely made it to orbit. And I'm looking at my scroll here, my shuttle scroll, I call it, uh, as we've frozen up there for some reason. There we are. Thank you, Jessica. Came to save the day there. Here's my shuttle scroll there, Steve, like Moses here. I've got the... Uh, can go down. STS uh, 93 was yes. July 99, mm -hmm. and Eileen Collins was her first command. Ashby was the pilot. They had their hands full because they had the very heavy Chandra X-ray observatory, one of the heaviest payloads, if not the heaviest, that the shuttle put up, uh, a, a major part of uh, NASA's uh, uh, orbiting observatories. And so that was in 99, Columbia, 26th mission for Columbia, by the yep. way. Welcome everybody back to the American Space Museum Stay Curious program. I'm Mark Marquette and we're here with Steve Kane. This is part two, sorry for the interruption, but we have, uh, we were just talking about uh, STS-93 in 1999 having a <laughs> glitch or a, a blurb yep. in its electrical system and we got kicked off uh, the internet somehow here. But uh, glad that Steve Kane's with us. This oral history is part of what we are bringing to you uh, many times a month, oral histories of space workers and a few astronauts made possible by the Marie Louise G. West endowment that we're so grateful for because they allowed us to buy some uh, equipment to do things in a, a more professional way. We were just talking to Steve Kane about the wiring on a space shuttle. And STS-93 had a screw that was in the wiring and, um, uh, basically short-circuited some of one of the engines, right? Well, engine and they, control. They, it, it, it was an engine they were called control. Max, main engine controllers. And it was an abort to orbit, all right, Correct. which was the the last stage before you don't orbit. Right, <laughs> okay. before you do the return. Before you gotta, you got to land somewhere in the world. And, and uh, usually that spot was going to be over North Africa or South yeah. Spain in there. So, um, but tell us a little bit about the, he's, the wiring. Uh, and that's what we've had here in front here is a, uh, uh, the orbiter piece of that wiring that explain how, how um, um, compl not complicated, how extensive this wiring job was. And how well, many miles of wiring are in a shuttle, well, there's, remember? There's, there's probably seven or 800 miles of wiring in the shuttle. 800 miles of wiring in and, a space and shuttle. And Columbia especially had more wiring than the others because it was a, a test vehicle. Yeah. Vital. So it carried a lot of additional wiring. The maiden one of the whole program. Uh, this wire is made out of Kapton. You know, it's a Kapton wiring is what it's called. So it has a, a very fragile uh, insulating Now we know layer. Kapton from the foil that was on the lunar module. Correct. And, and they began manufacturing wire out of Kapton to reduce the weight. Teflon is a lot heavier. Mm -hmm. So Kapton made a lot more sense from a weight characteristic, but it made it very fragile. And when the screw went into the wire bundle, it shorted, knocked these offline. And what that did was kicked off an investigation of the vehicles because they'd always had anomalies on flight, different things that were, were wire related. We discovered you know, a couple of things in, in the way that the wires were laid out when the orbiters were built. But the other thing that we discovered is that they were essentially built by system. And when you take a, a piece of wire and you cut it flat, you create a blunt edge and as you pass this through wire bundles, as you're adding a system to the vehicles when you're constructing them, mm -hmm. those blunt pieces damage the Kapton and adjacent wiring. So one of the things that occurred after this event was the shuttles were essentially grounded until we were able to, you know, essentially ascertain exactly how extensive this was. So we ended up actually with discovery, you know, while this was occurring, 
uh, Discovery was slated for its orbiter maintenance modification period at mm -hmm. Rockwell in California. Uh, USA had a proposal into NASA to do the work here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, that was accepted. It saved NASA quite a bit of money. They didn't have to transport it out there. So one of the things that occurred on Discovery was once we discovered what had happened with uh, Columbia, mm -hmm. is we began an extensive wire inspection effort as part of this orbiter maintenance modification period. And actually, we ended up doing wire inspection probably three times from end to end on all 800 miles of that wiring or as much as we could access. Hmm. A lot of it wasn't accessible. We had to inspect a lot of it with borescopes. Uh, but the, the areas that we could inspect, what we discovered is just what you were mentioning earlier about, you know, the technicians accessing the different areas in the shuttle, you know, created a lot of this damage because they were, they were access areas uh, to get to a lot of the equipment that needed to be maintained. You had to go across these. You had to bring equipment across them. There were a lot of different reasons. But the maps that were generated as a result of the inspection efforts showed that the majority of the damage occurred in ingress, egress areas of the vehicles. Oh, really? So uh, there were a lot of things that came out of that. Yeah, we replaced a lot of wiring. Uh, we uh, re-insulated a lot of wiring. We replaced a lot of connectors. Uh, just a lot of tremendous effort you know, to, to bring those back up to speed. But it was my understanding that after all of those efforts were done, a lot of those spurious anomalies that occurred went away. Hmm. You know, in the later uh, stages of the shuttle program, they just didn't have those anomalies like they did in the early days. So, yes, that was the first uh, third of, of the whole program. Ninety nine is uh, July ninety nine is when this flight uh, Steve's talking about that Eileen Collins uh, commanded, uh, and then they did fly Discovery in December five months later, and that was the third Hubble service mission. So that was an important one to get off there, and then. Uh, uh, well, that, you, that, 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 that was right, Steve, right when we started flying ISS missions, okay. The construction of the International Space Station starting in 1999 in this era. Uh, then, with then we, uh, Cabana, we Bob Cabana taking years. up uh, in 98 the first, or uh, May, May, May of 99, the first elements of Yeah, it. we actually sat, sat down for a couple of years and didn't fly because of a lot of the anomalies and, until that filtered out. Yes. I'm not sure what those dates were, but there were... Yeah, there was a period of time, you know, there where we didn't fly. So what an it's like rewiring your whole house, discovering you got to rewire everything in your whole house. No or big deal for a it. house yeah. unless you live in a mansion. But these shuttles are mansions, so uh, that was a lot of material expended and a lot of uh, just lot scrapping of out. And you have a, a piece of, of that wire. I do. Yeah, this was a plaque that was. I hold that there for Marty, please. This is a plaque that in. was presented to the people that worked on the inspection effort. We worked really closely with the orbital electrical engineers who were responsible for the wiring and developing the inspection methods that allowed that uh, process the, to, to be performed. And the wire's green, uh, of course, uh, Marty and Jessica. Uh, Filter. You, uh, yeah, green, well, on our green screen, but uh, right under Steve's name here, that's where the wire is. That's it. Yeah, it doesn't show, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe tilt it forward. There. Hey, you get a little bit there. But one of the little mementos as space yeah, workers this, this get along the nice, way yeah. from United Space Alliance there for a good job uh, doing all that. Uh, it was a tremendous team effort, obviously. Oh, it was, yes. It, and, was, uh, it was quite an effort. Uh, and then uh, uh, flying the shuttle for another 12 years, like you said, you didn't have these little anomalies that you thought uh, had gone yeah, in there. It was interesting. Toward the end of the program, uh, it used to be that it was difficult to get the orbiters complete and ready when the payloads are ready. It was always a rush to do that. Toward the end of the program, it was more uh, the shuttles, were, the orbiters were ready, and we were waiting for payload. Hmm. You know, because all of those processing problems, you know, over the course of the, the the program were resolved. A smooth flow on your integration charts, as you guys yeah. put it in there, and yep, so the forth. Uh, yes. Uh, well, we've been, we're, we're enjoying talking to Steve Kane here and about to end our little conversation. But I wanted to ask, Steve has been in all of the major facilities on our Space Coast uh, from uh, 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 the uh, AstroTech, uh, where they build, where they, one of the clean room here on the coast, yeah. to uh, Blue Origin. You've been in their facility, SpaceX. Uh, give us kind of your 
your uh, overview of, 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 we know what's happened. Uh, private space industry has saved the Space Coast, basically, uh, uh, financially, uh, mm -hmm. with the good jobs and homes hard to find and our infrastructure is getting built up better. Yep. But uh, your observation working as a NASA contractor and then dealing uh, or, uh, with the private entrepreneurs out there. What's your take on that, Steve? Well, I, I think what we're seeing is a, is a complete paradigm shift in how we get things, people, materials, equipment into orbit. You know, the, the space shuttle orbiters were a good space truck. They allowed us to, to work, you know, take the lessons learned from Skylab and the other previous missions, Gemini, uh, Apollo, you know, all the lessons learned from that you know, went into the shuttle program. The shuttle program allowed us to take things into orbit. You know, we learned how to work in orbit, but we really learned how to work in a different way when, when the International Space Station was created. That then showed us how we could actually live and work in space. And I think as we move forward, you know, these new space companies, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Biospace, uh, some of the others that are producing launch vehicles now are going to take it a step further. And allow us to do even more in space you know i see private space stations coming mm -hmm. uh, you know the iss has a limited life you know eventually it won't be able to, to sustain and, and at that point you know the commercial space companies i believe are going to step in and take on a lot of that role uh, there's a lot of work that can be done in space you know it, it's a tremendous manufacturing environment mm -hmm. and we work with a, a couple of other entities one is actually, uh, uh, he, he worked with, with Space Tech for a period of time. Uh, he, he's in Jacksonville. I worked for his brother when I was working the quality uh, engineering area at USA. Uh, his name is Larry Harvey, and Larry works for, a, he, he now is director of an organization called CAST, and it's the Center for Applied Space Technologies. Mm -hmm. And what their role is is integrating life sciences experiments from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville into the launch vehicles that can then be taken to the, the space station. And and so it's interesting to see how all of that work is occurring. And that's all transitioning to commercial space as well. So, uh, you know, there's, there's tremendous opportunities there for companies. Uh, I think they're solving, you know, the, the cost of access to space problem mm -hmm. that has really stopped a lot of companies from getting involved. You know, there's so many launch vehicle providers now, and I think we see with Turan Global building the satellite processing facility here, uh, or satellite manufacturing facility, that there's a huge backlog of equipment and capabilities that need, need to be flown into space. There's a lot of aging satellites that are eventually not going to be working anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some defense issues with those large monolithic satellites in that they're hard to defend uh, smaller satellites and mo more smaller satellites multiple satellites is, is, is much more I guess conducive to operations in space. quick access to uh, yeah. and to replace even those with the satellites. limited space life you know they can still burn up upon return you know and, and be replaced relatively easily mm -hmm. you know, everything has scaled down the size of equipment is much less you know semiconductors of continue to to scale down in size mm -hmm. and so all of that has led to i think where we are now and you know it seems like every 10 years there's a huge leap forward and i think we're going to see that going forward it's just going to continue how about these facilities themselves that you've been in i've not been in blue origins facility you've been in a lot of the the space centers or uh, uh manufacturing facilities around the country uh, are they cutting edge? Uh, oh, they're absolutely is, cutting edge. Uh, uh, a good example is Airbus OneWeb satellites over here in Exploration Park. Uh, they're an Industry 4.0 manufacturing facility. And for those of you that don't follow Industry 4.0, this was a manufacturing concept that actually began in Germany. And uh, it's fully automated facility. Uh, they use smart tools in that the tools are set up by a machine. You know, the torques are set, the operations, the uh, attachments that are required on the tools are set by machines. Technicians operate them, obviously, but it takes a lot of the human error component out of it. Hmm. Uh, so it involves uh, not only automated manufacturing, but the Internet of Things. 
uh, where everything is communicating as a system. And it's kind of the way of the future. It allowed Airbus One Led satellites to what normally took a company like Lockheed Martin or uh, some of the other, Northrop Grumman or some of the others that built these large satellite structures, it allows them now to mass produce these. Uh, Airbus OneWeb satellites can produce about four satellites a day wow. in their facility. So it it's really allows, it, you know, and these are a lot smaller. Of course, they're they're refrigerator sized satellites, so they're a lot smaller than the large, you know, payload bay filling satellites that we were used to seeing. Mm -hmm. But they're going to continue to get smaller, mm -hmm. and and which allows, I guess, more of them to be launched as well. So. Well, how about the manned spacecraft uh, situation or Inspiration4? I mean, SpaceX uh, uh, has got the corner now on, on our access to the uh, International Space Station. Elon Musk keeps uh, poking Jeff Bezos in the ribs uh, every chance he can. To, uh, to, when's he going to build an orbiter? But I think Bezos' uh, impact is going to be seen in the next two or three I years. Do too. The new Glenn rocket is going to be the largest rocket ever produced. This is huge rocket. The new rocket. Glenn, 18 feet in diameter. Yeah. Most of them are around 14 or 13, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, it, and the, the manufacturing facility at Blue Origin, state of the art. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a fully fully state of the art facility. Uh, I'm sure Turan Global when they build their manufacturing facility it'll be the same uh, you know these companies have invested a lot here uh, to do this and, and the reason they have is because they know that there's a great opportunity you know to, to take this commercial you know of course NASA and the space launch system has mm -hmm. a place as well because NASA you know when they operated shuttle they kind of got away from their mission which was to do the hard things you know and they focused on operating the space shuttle program at tremendous cost and it drained their resources and being able to move away from that operational environment and into more of the the type of work that they're doing now with SLS I think is is the right way to go you know for that space agency so I, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with space launch system mm -hmm. you know with you know building the gateway uh, Artemis you know with Orion and, and what it's going to do I look forward to their flight I hope it happens sooner you know, it was supposed to fly, I believe, in December. It might be January or February now before it flies. I'm not sure. But, you know, with Lockheed Martin, you know, taking over the facility on State Road 405 where they're going to be doing a lot of that work, mm -hmm. you know, with, with Orion. And, we, of course, we have Boeing out in Michoud producing the center section for that. So there, there's just a lot of work going on that, you know, hopefully will get us back to the moon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good stepping stone, you know, going to Mars. I hope I see that in my lifetime. That we're actually sending people out. Exciting time. They Exc are. Exciting, exciting time, time to, be, uh, to be on the Space Coast for sure. Uh, and as Executive Director of Space Tech, you're poised brilliantly to uh, help all of these space companies. Well, it's interesting. Before we took on the, the apprenticeship program, very little of the work that we did was in Florida. In mm -hmm. fact, it wasn't even in our business plan. Really? Honestly. Most of the work we did was outside here. We do a lot of work with the military, especially. They're probably our, our, our biggest customer, but we do a lot of work with standards organizations like ASTM International and Society of Automotive Engineers. You know, we do credentialing for both of those entities. Uh, so, yeah, that's really what our focus has been since the Space Tech grant concluded in, in 2017. You know, there's, we kind of had to move. There wasn't a large enough pool of space uh, business for us to sustain what we have so we had to move into a dis different mm -hmm. uh, marketplace and, and that's the board of directors at space tech these are wonderful people that you know their advice and consent is essential to where we're going and, what and we're they doing. are movers and shakers in the business oh, too you've got are. one heck of a board of directors uh, for sure yep. uh, i've met some of the gentlemen and women yep. involved and uh, yep. very yeah I'm, I'm thrilled to be working with with them you know as we continue doing what we're doing and, and I, I think we're in pretty good position now to, to continue for a while. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and we I have to give a shout out to the American Space Museum too because Karen and and is the reason we're here in Titusville mm -hmm. because yeah, as we were discussing partnerships and how we could work together, it, it was noted that there was a facility here in Titusville that could potentially uh, serve as an office space, and so 
we forged that partnership and we moved over here and and it's been just an upward trajectory ever since and steve's talking about karen conklin our executive director the last four years been passionately involved with this museum uh the past almost 20 years of her life and uh mm -hmm. what do you think about our museum steve and the passion that you see in our volunteers and employees oh it, yeah this is a trip down memory lane for anybody that's worked you know space programs but for those people that just really want to understand you know where we are and where we came from this is the place to come this is this is really cool the and where we're going are, and where we're going with great partners like you showing the uh how, how young people out there can uh better their lives by getting involved in in the space industry or the aerospace industry you know i'm, I'm always just amazed at all of the airplanes flying every day something like used to be like 5,000 commercial jets every every morning in the air. And uh, knock on wood, it's been a long time since we've had a very bad uh, air disaster. And I think that's a credit to companies like yourself that, are, that uh, are making sure excellence is always maintained in these risky... Uh, well, there are very few companies that do performance-based credentialing. And that's really our forte. And this came out of NASA programs. You know, NASA required technicians to demonstrate they could do the work mm -hmm. to become certified to do it. And, you know, when Dr. Kohler built this program, that same robust uh, practice was rolled into space tech when space tech was created. And this is what allowed the Office of Commercial Space to come in and take a look at it, issue us a safety approval, say, yes, the, the programs that you have, you know, meet requirements for supporting especially, especially reusable spacecraft. You know, like we see now with SpaceX and, and hopefully Blue Origin soon, Boeing CST, you know, when they when they finally get that off the ground. And, and, you know, we hope that's coming soon, too. So what we do, you know, there aren't a lot of companies that do that. It's difficult to do. It's easier to produce a computer-based test and administer it mm -hmm. than it is to uh, develop a team of qualified individuals that actually administer the performance testing piece. But we have a, a network around the country of qualified administrators that do just that uh, these are individuals that we contract with to administer the performance piece and and we'll continue to follow that path because high value equipment requires a demonstration of competence otherwise you run the risk of product damage personnel damage uh, there's just a lot of reasons why the individuals that do that work you need to ensure that they have those capabilities mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. We've been talking with Steve Kane about the, the careers in, in the space industry. Is there something I haven't asked you, Steve, that you'd love to share with our Stay Curious viewers out there on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook? Well, what I would say is if you're interested in a good career, you know, take a look at the aerospace industry. You know, there, there's a lot of opportunities, uh, not just here. You know, there are areas all around the country that are doing a lot of work. Uh, north of Grumman in the Salt Lake City area, uh, north of Grumman actually up at Wallops, you know, in, in Virginia, uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, Michoud in New Orleans, up in Huntsville. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of work going. At Wichita is another one. Yeah, so, so there's just a lot of areas uh, that a person can find a really good career. But just like with when I started my career, uh, you really need a skill. And, you know, I obtained mine in the military, which allowed me then to move beyond that. But apprenticeships, uh, any kind of work-based learning is the way to go because you need the skill set to do this work. Well, thank you, Steve. Been very, very interesting here. And we've enjoyed everybody. Uh, hope they've enjoyed everything on the program today to stay curious if you're wondering what's been fluttering back here is i keep forgetting to put up the basket that we're raffling off steve look at all these apollo goodies this is our apollo basket That's that uh, we uh, did have a little hiccup in in august uh, uh, where we closed the museum for a couple weeks but every month we want to give away a basket of space memorabilia five dollars on paypal uh, you can get a ticket and we'll fix you up and have a drawing uh, later uh, in October to give this away. Uh, we've had a lot of guests in our museum now uh, can, getting their $5 raffle ticket. There's a shuttle bear in there, Apollo 11 patch, 
some Apollo 11 swag. There's a pendant from the Kennedy Space Center in the 70s. We got a hat there, over a couple hundred dollars worth of gifts in there. We've got a shuttle uh, a plate and so forth. So uh, there you go. Apollo Legacy basket there that for $5, the raffle, you can go uh, to our website and contribute through PayPal your $5 or get multiple tickets and we will ship it to you or find ways to get it to you uh, if you win it on there. So thank you for reminding me of that. And uh, uh, Thursday, we will catch up on some space history with Marty, Jessica, and myself. And then Friday, we'll have Triple T sitting right, right. where Steve Kane was Everybody today, travels. telling you some stories from the White Room. So until we meet again uh, under our starry skies and our space uh, spacious skies of outer space uh we appreciate steve being here and all of our uh staff for supporting our our program here and we'll be back with you tomorrow to bridge the space between us until then i'm mark marquette hoping you'll stay curious <laughs>